Yo, Philly landlords. Welcome to Landlords Connect, Philadelphia edition, another edition of our podcast on all things related to being a landlord in Philadelphia, your resource for becoming a successful landlord in the Philadelphia area. We're still in the early days of producing the podcast, and I just want to remind you to subscribe and please leave a uh, review if you're using Apple Podcasts. It helps us push the podcast forward. When you subscribe, you'll be alerted to new episodes, so it'll keep you up to date. And please share with your friends and colleagues and help us to reach out to landlords throughout the region so that more and more people have access to this important information. For those um, who aren't aware, this all started on a Facebook group called Philadelphia Landlords Connect. Please look for it on on Facebook. Uh, it'll all be all this information will be on the show notes, so that you can find it easily. The group is now approaching 1,300 members, and the growth has been exponential since we lost launched this podcast. It's not your typical real estate group. This is a group for anybody who owns residential real estate in in the Philadelphia region. And it's all about learning, sharing, and improving your business. So again, please subscribe. And now on to today's podcast. Um, today, we're going to be talking about insurance. Um, we have a guest who'll be able to give us some invaluable tips about what to look out for and what's important to know when it comes to liability and protection. I reached out to him um, or actually I reached out to his partner first, who had given me some invaluable uh, assistance when I recently really needed my insurance. I had two homes that were hit by Hurricane Ian, and um, they were both literally in the center of the, the storm. It turned out that the hardest part of this for me was the, the the not knowing in the first days in the aftermath of the storm where we didn't know what had happened to the properties and couldn't get in touch with anybody. Fortunately, ended up that I did have good coverage and came out of the whole situation fairly unscathed. We had a lot of damage, but we're 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 fine. Uh, so I uh, got a lot of good advice from uh, the company that our guest uh, represents. And I also learned a lot about what I need to be looking at in my policies. I did have some some key mistakes that I had made um, with my insurance policies, and now I know much better uh, how to how to look at a policy and um, what to be aware of. Um, so let me introduce um, the guest without further ado. Uh, our guest is Blake Zucker who grew up in Plymouth Meeting and attended Plymouth White Marsh High School. He's a graduate of Penn State and Villanova Law School, so a local boy made good. Blake has been with Clark and Cohen Property Loss Consultants since 2018, and he's a fourth generation of his family to work at Clark and Cohen. That's incredible. According to their website, website, the company was founded in 1921, so that in itself speaks for itself about the wealth of knowledge on insurance that these guys have. Today, Blake lives in the Philly suburb of Fort Washington with his wife and two daughters. He serves as the Director of Adjustment Services at Clark and Cohen and helps to oversee all claims that come through. So this guy has a wealth of knowledge to share with us. So let me turn it over to you, Blake, and can you just start by telling us a bit about yourself and your connection with the city, the region, and how your career took the path that it did? Yeah, thanks, Cheryl. Appreciate it. I'm really happy to be here. Um, so growing up, uh, my mom uh, was a Cohen. Uh, Clark and Cohen is ironically not the same Cohen, but nevertheless <laughs> part of our family since 1921. Uh, like you said, the, we're actually the first public adjusters in Pennsylvania. Um, so we were 102 years old now. Uh, growing up, I didn't know that much about the business because my mom was not part of it. My uncle, Rich Cohen, owns it now. My grandfather, Barry, and great-grandfather, Gene, uh, were all part of it. Um, my dad, ironically, was an attorney. So, you know, I, I had to go to law school first before I got involved. But I uh, went to law school, uh, was, was in, the, in the law world for about a year, uh, did not like what I was doing. Uh, gave my uncle, Rich, a call and said, hey, can I, can I come aboard? He was more than happy to welcoming me. So I'm the... Uh, 
I was the fourth generation, as you said, mentioned earlier, my cousin Brett is also uh, my partner. Um, he joined about six months after I did. Um, so yeah, it was uh, an interesting path to get here, but it couldn't be happier to be part of what I'm doing now. So it's, that's incredible. The, like the, the fourth generation thing is, is, is something, um, that I, I think it's really, uh, meaningful when a company has, has been around that long and continues the, um, you know, through, through generations in the family. And it says something about the, the, the quality of the, the company, as well as the knowledge that gets hands down, handed down from generation to generation. Um, so one of the reasons that I wanted to ask you here, as opposed to talking about these topics with, say, an insurance company or an insurance agent, is because I believe that maybe you have kind of a, an objective perspective that you can share with us. And insurance is something that um, for landlords, it's something we have to have. It's something we all complain about. We don't like spending money on insurance. Sometimes people feel like, oh, why do I need insurance if I didn't use it? Why are my rates going up if I never had a claim? All kinds of things that uh, that, 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 that bother people about insurance. But nonetheless, it's a critical part of, of owning property, of protecting yourself uh, with liability, as well as protecting yourself from you know, major catastrophe. Um, and like I said, in at the start, I've been a uh, uh, I'm a good example of it that I could have never imagined having to deal with two houses hit by a hurricane. But like I said, I came through it fine. Um, in some ways, maybe even came out of this better than than previous. Um, so, um, so I wanted to ask you why. Um, can you give listeners an understanding of why they need to have insurance coverage that's specific to investment properties? Uh, and, and if everybody needs the same exact coverage or is it a case by case decision? Um, should they always take the least expensive quote, which is what a lot of people do? So for, yeah, first off, you do not want to take the least expensive quote. Um, everybody needs insurance for the reasons you just mentioned, liability, uh, casualty, all that, all those different things. Um, you want to make, especially for investors who aren't living in the property, you want to make sure that you have the correct coverages in order to, you know, get the money you deserve. If for, you know, God forbid there was a fire or a pipe break and your tenant had to move out, you know, a lot of the, you know, a lot of people's income depends directly on the rent they're receiving from their tenants. So if you don't have the proper policy, you might not have that loss of rent coverage, um, which is crucial. Uh, so you don't want to take the least expensive quote. And you, you know, not every situation is the same, um, but everybody should have those kind of policies that will allow you to get paid for the lost rent if for some reason your your tenant couldn't live there. Uh, again, you know, each property is different and the size, the where it's located, um, those are all factors in the kind of policy you want to have. But you don't, you know, you, you don't want to take the cheap way out. Of, you know, I, I understand no one wants to pay for insurance, especially if they're not using it, but and you don't even know you have it until you need it. But when you need it, you need it. And you want to make sure that it's in place properly. So, you know, when those unforeseen things happen, you're taken care of. Okay. So, so for example, I only learned about some of the things that, that, that I should have known already about when, when I had to actually use the insurance. Uh, an example that, that maybe is relevant is uh, I had two fences totally destroyed. And I just assumed that, of course, I'll be covered for this. They were hit by a hurricane. I have hurricane coverage, and they were they they were pretty much destroyed. But the there wasn't a limitation on how much those those were covered. So, can you maybe talk about like some of the misunderstandings you see often when people come to you and they think they might have some coverage that it ends up they're limited or don't have that coverage at all? Sure. So, on a typical residential policy, there's four main coverages a through d is most, what most companies have so you have the building covered itself then you have typically other structures which the fence is probably another structure uh then you have the third one which is personal property so in a case where you're a landlord you probably don't have much personal property um then lastly is the d which is loss of use or loss of income rent however you want to quantify it so uh, most people think that when they cover it they cover you know they have coverage but they have different coverages for different things. So, you know, the first coverage for the building is going to be the, the biggest. Um, and then the other coverages are going to usually be a percentage off of the main coverage. So in your in your 
case for another structure as a fence or a shed or a detached garage, a pool, things like that. It's typically 10% of your overall coverage. Um, so, you know, simply if you have a hundred thousand dollars for your house, you probably have $10,000 for other structures. Now, if you don't know any better, you just assume that you have coverage for everything. Um, but if you do, you know, I always tell people to get more coverage for other structures, especially if you have, you know, heavy fencing or a pool or detached garage, things of real stature, um, you want to make sure that you are adequately covered for those things. So it's a big misunderstanding that coverage isn't just coverage. There's multiple coverages and I'm, I simplified it for those four. There's additional within the policy, but overall, those are the four main ones and the four ones you want to really make sure are, you know, adequately covered for your situation. Again, the land itself isn't what you're insuring. Another thing that people misunderstand. You might buy your house for five hundred thousand dollars because the land you have an acre of land, which is great. But really, what you're insuring is the physical structures on the land, not the land itself, which is another big misunderstanding people have. You know, if your if your yard gets ripped up, it, it may not be covered because that's not what the policy says. Um, so again, you want to really make sure that those other structures, personal property, less than tenant, you know, situations, but and loss of use are adequately insured. Okay, and. So that I, I'm glad you really, that you broke it down because it's all there in the policy, but a lot of people just don't look at it. They trust the agent to have you know created the 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 correct policy to fit their needs, and then they just uh, forget about it until the day that they actually need it. Another area that and and in cities like Philadelphia, unfortunately, it's an it's something that comes up frequently. I think is vandalism or theft, and are most policies automatically covering that? And if they do, what, like, where is that in the policy? So most policies will cover it to a certain extent um, and it will be within the body of the policy. So typically when you get a policy, you're going to get a deck page that's, you know, four to seven pages giving you, again, those, those four that I mentioned with limitations of how much coverage you have, and then your deductibles on there and a couple other things. But whenever I get a new claim, I always ask for the full, po the full policy because within the meat, the body of the policy is where everything is spelled out. Um, vandalism and theft are typically covered unless, you know, again, it's always in the unless, right? Unless something says they're not. Um, a big a big thing for that is, is vacancy. So if a property is under construction and it's vacant, then those things will should be covered. If it's vacant because you haven't rented it for a while because the market or whatever, uh, there's a good chance that those things wouldn't be covered unless there was security in place or a you know a fence around it or something like that. So we we handle plenty of vandalism and theft losses, especially in Philadelphia, as you mentioned. But they ne really need to either be under construction or they need to be you know people living there. Um, and if not, they would have you know you might want to get a builder's risk policy to make sure that those coverages are are in place. So when my if if I'm in between tenants and someone breaks into the house and steals all of the appliances, uh, does a lot of damage. If I was still under my just regular landlord policy, then I would probably not be uh, eligible for coverage. I mean, for a uh, claim. So it, it needs to, it's on, it's gonna be on a case by case basis with the policy. Um, typically there's either a 30 or 60 day period where they'll allow it uh, because Obviously, you can't just rent a house over overnight. Um, so, yeah, within each policy, like I said, that's why we need everything there to, to read through everything. But there's usually some sort of time period where vacancy is acceptable um, in order to get that coverage. And then in other in other scenarios, if vacant past that time, there may just be a penalty, like fifteen percent. So you could only recover eighty five percent of what is owed to you. If, if in again, each case is different, but. Sure. Yeah, you know, that, that that's what you're looking for. And often you'll hear that people that, that there's a lot of things people expect to be covered for and then and then they're not. Like a big thing is uh sewer lines and and you know sewer backups and all that kind of thing. Can you explain a little bit about that cuz it's it's very confusing. In Philadelphia in particular, there they pushed a program called AWR, which is an insurance company that just does policies for the the sewer and water lines and actually they do some other things as well and a lot of people are caught by surprise when they 
they didn't know about that insurance because they thought they have full coverage and then something happens and they find out that they've got a you know, it could be thousands and thousands of dollars of repairs that they have to make on their own bill. Yeah. So, and the typical policy back was from sewers and drains are, is not a covered loss. Um, it's an endorsement that you'd have to add on through your agent to get that kind of coverage. Again, every company is different between all state, state farm travelers, you know, name them, them all. They're all going to be different and how they cover everything is going to be different. But the backup of sewers and drains, for example, is, typically an added on endorsement that you'd have to pay more for to get the coverage. Um, but I would recommend it to everybody, especially in the city of Philadelphia. If you have a sump pump, if you have a French drain, anything like that, there's really no reason not to have the extra coverage for, you know, it's a minimal cost per month. Um, but yeah, water specifically is probably the greatest source of frustration for homeowners or property owners because the way it's covered in insurance is very limited. Um, water that comes from the ground or underground or surface water is not covered unless you specifically have, you know, flood insurance. Um, so, you know, I get calls daily about water in my basement, water here, where to come from. Oh, uh, the pipe broke under the ground. I'm sorry. I, I wish I could help you, but I, you know, the, the contract says what the contract says. Um, so water that comes from the ground is not covered unless further insurance is bought. Um, water that comes from above in, you know, depending on the situation, can be covered. Um, but water specifically, I would say, is the biggest issue that homeowners, property owners are going to have when it comes to insurance. So so a lot and a lot of those things, like you're talking about people call you and they save water in their basement would be perhaps, I mean, it could be a, a significant amount of damage and a significant claim, but it, it can also often be you know minor claims of of anywhere from a few hundred dollars to a few thousand dollars. Should people claim everything? Um, no, they should not. So, well, first of all, if their deductible is more than what they're claiming, they're not going to get paid. Um, and it's not the same as car insurance, where if you get an accident, your rates are all automatically going up. Rates should not increase, you know, unless some, you know, you have multiple claims a year. The market can obviously dictate that differently, but you should claim something that's above your deductible and that is a covered loss. Um, so I go to houses, businesses weekly that I say, either don't make a claim or don't hire me because it's not worth their time to pay me for something that isn't going to be covered or the min it's a, it's a minimal loss that they, it's a, it's not going to be worth, it's not worth it for them to hire us. And I wouldn't want to, I don't want to take anyone's, you know, fee from anybody that's not going to get enough money. Right. Okay. And so maybe that's a good time to talk about how how is it that a public adjuster works and when when do I call a public adjuster as opposed to just submitting the claim and waiting for my insurance company to pay me? So you should call a public adjuster before you call anybody else um, because you want to make sure that everything that you're saying to the insurance company to their adjuster is accurate and and best favoring you know you because if you say something whether or not it's you know written down or not you don't want anyone's mind to get you know, think differently. So we like to, we like to be there with, with the adjuster from the insurance company, walking through, gathering the scope together. It makes the whole process easier. If we come in after they've already gotten their estimate together, it's more difficult to change their mind about what might be covered and what's not covered. So the first thing to do is call a public adjuster. We bring out our own building consultant, our own contents consultant, our own accountant if needed to make sure that everything is taken care of from A to Z. Um, it's like, a, I always refer to like a basketball team. If the insurance company has five players and it's just you against five, you're never going to win. But if you call us, we're the point guard, we're the quarterback, we make everything work for everybody. And we have all the different players to make sure that, you know, we get everything that you deserve. So is there, could you give like a range, like, is there a minimum uh, size of a claim that it would be right to call an, an insurance adjuster for? If, if I have a, uh, uh, I'll think of just a personal experience where I had a, uh, uh, HVAC system was smashed. The, um, the condenser unit out in the back of the house had been totally smashed and it's going back many years. And so I reached out to insurance. I, I kind of regret having done that. And, and it, I, I maybe, I don't even remember if I got any money back or whatever, but something like that, would I call an insurance adjuster or is I would that say yeah, I would say call a public adjuster. I mean, no matter what, like I okay. said, like I said, we, 
will tell you, we'll give you, especially Clark and Cohen, we'll give you advice whether you hire us or not. But you always call first to make sure that you have the proper education. The same way as you would do any, you know, if you broke your tooth, you'd, you'd go to the dentist no matter how bad the chip was. Um, so <laughs> always call us first, making sure that you have all the correct information because you don't want to go into something blind. Like, like your example with the fence is, if you only have $10,000 of fence coverage and you have $15,000 worth of damage, I'm not going to take your claim, but I'm going to tell you how to do it, right? Because it wouldn't make sense to pay me a fee off of what you're collecting if you're not going to get me a hole in the end anyway. But I always want to help no matter how I can and walk you through the process, whether we're on the front lines or we're given information from you know the sidelines, essentially. Okay. That's great to know. And, and thank you for that. Mm. Um, but okay. So some people will hesitate to call mm. a public adjuster. And I think there's a mixture of information out there. And obviously, like any business, any industry, there's a mixture and you know a range of types of, of public adjusters. Uh, like I said in the beginning, you guys have been in this game for a hundred years now, right? Mm -hmm. And and so you know, obviously know what you're doing and and doing something right. Again, I'll just go back to my own experience where when I was dealing with a situation where literally every every structure was hit by a hurricane. So there was an inundation of all kinds of contractors and and scam artists and all kinds of people going into the area in order to to handle the the huge volume of, of claims, of damage, of, of, of everything that needed to be done in order to recover from the hurricane. And I saw a lot of chatter about public adjusters and that some of them, and, and I actually talked to, I, I actually heard a podcast of somebody. So I reached out to her because I was curious about how she handles things. And I got nervous right away. This is before I spoke to you guys. Uh, she started talking in a way that made me uncomfortable of how she operates. So without going into all that, I just, you know, what, what are the things that we should look out for when talking to a public adjuster? Sure. So uh, the, the, first of all, the bar, the bar to become a public adjuster is very low. Um, you don't have to go to get an extra degree or go to school or you have to be 18 and pass a test and get bonded, essentially. Um, so there are a lot of public adjusters, especially in Philadelphia, because there's no limit on fees in, in, in Pennsylvania. So in New Jersey and Delaware, they cap the fee percentage you could take um, as a contingency. But in Pennsylvania, there is not one. So you know, you have public adjusters who may be charging, you know, upwards of 30 to 35 percent for a claim, which I think is egregious. So there, it, because there's no limit there, there are a lot of people who do this. So um, you want to really look out for making sure that, like like you said, you know, companies that have been around for a long time, um, that when you talk to someone, they're professional, they're wearing, you know, they're wearing nice clothes, they speak eloquently, they know, they know what they're talking about within the, the policy. I think that's probably the biggest thing is being able to read and decipher what the policy says in order to help the clients the best. Um, because the, the policy is the key. We use that as, as the tool for everything. If it says something in there, then, then we can get it. Uh, a quick, funny little anecdote was, I got a call from a woman who had her Barbie collection stolen. Uh, <laughs> 57, somehow the Comcast guy stole 57 Barbies. The, uh, we put together the claim, it was I think like $32,000. Uh, the insurance company offered her two thousand dollars because they'd appreciated all you know all the Barbies. I went within the policy and found that collectible items were paid off at market value and it cannot be depreciated. Two weeks later, she had the full thirty-two thousand dollars. If she if someone was that wasn't there reading that policy for her, she would have known what to do and she would have just not had the money that was owed to her. And it wasn't the insurance company even being malicious. They were they, they were just paying it how they thought they should pay it. But within the policy. She had a different kind of endorsement and we got her paid correctly. So the most important thing for public adjusters is knowing what the policy says and how to best use it to benefit the insured. So all I'm thinking about right now is the box of Barbies I have in my basement. <laughs> <laughs> you might want to get those, you might want to get those scheduled on a little and on an extra uh, an extra couple of dollars a month. Yeah. So actually is so actually it reminds me of one of the questions I wanted to ask you, which was each time we have some kind of a change or, you know, we bring something into the, the house or make a, a, a improvement to the house, should we be calling the insurance agent and updating them about that? 
Yes, definitely. Certainly like things like jewelry, um, you know, fine arts, those things have very small limitations within the policy. So for example, if you have a, you know, a engagement ring that costs $10,000, it's probably only insured within the policy for about a thousand dollars. So you can get it scheduled separately at the correct value. So if God forbid someone burglarizes your home or a fire or whatever, you're adequately insured. So definitely things that are expensive like that, you know, like I said, jewelry, fine arts, um, those things should be scheduled separately to make sure that they are adequately insured. You know, electronics, those things, that they're, they're not a big deal, but the, the more expensive, finer things should be scheduled separately. Okay. And should we be looking at the uh, the value of the, the house and how much for, for the A, B, C, D uh, parts of the policy? For each of those, each year, should we be going through the policy with the agent and making sure that it's correct? And do we trust the agent to know what's correct? So, yeah, I mean, you should trust the agent. That's what their job is. And you should be going through it each year. Hopefully, they're asking you each year, you know, can we have an, a meeting to talk about things? Um, but a, another misconception people have is how to value a home. It's not valued at the market price to what you could sell it off Zillow or, you know, what your mortgage is. You should insure it to what it would cost to build it from the ground up. So you might be able to buy, like I said earlier, the land is not involved. So you might be able to buy a house for X dollars, but it's actually going to cost you Y dollars to rebuild that house. And that's how much you want to insure the house for. Also within a homeowner's policy, there's what's called co-insurance potentially issues where you have to insure the home typically to 80% of what it would cost. And if you don't insure it to that much and you have, and you do have a claim, you can be penalized based off of that and only be able to collect a certain percentage of, of your insurance. So yeah, I would say every year you should talk, especially, I mean, through the pandemic, the cost of goods and the supply chain and all those things were astronomical. So people were seeing that they were very underinsured based off of those things. So I would say every year you should call your agent or hopefully they call you, talk about how much you should insure your property for and make sure that it's adequately insured. Okay. And and what about in Philadelphia? Is there a need to be aware of changes in building code and things like that? And that that's something that needs to be mentioned in in the policy in some way? Sure. So there is a coverage called law and ordinance coverage. Um, which speaks to the different codes. So, you know, you don't put, you know, knob and tube wiring in houses anymore. Um, and you don't, you know, now that, you know, you put five eighths inch drywall instead of half inch. Um, so that along, that is probably a extra coverage along with like backups and sewage and drains that you, but you want to make sure you have it because like I said, God forbid you have a fire and the house burns down. If it, if it was going to cost $5,000 to put in new wiring, but now it costs 10 because of the code, the insurance company is only liable for that if you have that law and ordinance coverage. Um, so that's definitely something you want to have, especially in a city like Philadelphia, where things are changing, you know, daily, um, and they're not getting any easier. So good, you mentioned knob and tube. Can do do you know what is the story with it? Because I have heard everything on the spectrum from if you have knob and tube, you can't have insurance to uh, to that it that that it's okay, or if you if they can't see it, then it's okay. All kinds of uh, things that I hear about it. Sure. So as, as as far as getting the insurance, I don't, I don't, we don't sell insurance, so I don't know enough to, to speak on that. Um, but you certainly can't put a, you certainly can't go back with it now and in anywhere with any kind of code. So if you have it and it's affected and you have to get some sort of architect plans or, you know, some, the township or the city needs to come in and do an inspection, that's something you're going to have to get upgraded through the code, through the law and ordinance. And if you don't have coverage for it, you're not going to, you know, you're not going to get paid for it. Okay. Okay. So is there, Blake, is there anything else that you can think of that you would want landlords to know or that, that, that you would recommend that we look out for when we're getting our insurance policies? Yeah. I mean, the, the most important thing is being adequately covered. Um, I, I, I too often see people who have, you know, half of the coverage that they should. And I don't, I mean the, the, the amount of coverage, not the, not the coverages, but the limit of insurance. If you have a house, you want to make it, it's just not worth it to, to pay a little bit less each month to not be insured correctly. Because when, when something happens and if you continue to, you know, if you're, if you're an investor and you're having multiple homes, eventually something's going to happen. Um, and you don't want to get to that point and then realize I'm not covered for this. So the most important thing is being adequately covered. 
and having the correct coverages, having backup sewage and drains, having code coverage. Um, like I said, for a couple extra dollars a month, it's it's more than than worth it. So I appreciate you know we appreciate all of this uh, all this good information, and I just want to really encourage people like take the time now, go over your policies, and make sure you have that adequate coverage because, like Blake said, eventually, unfortunately, you're gonna you're gonna need it one day, and you'll you you just don't know when that day is is coming. And you want to be able to sleep well. And that when something does happen, you want to know that you that you have the proper coverage. It's really, really important. Uh, also, thank you so much for the idea of you know, being able to reach out to you guys with, with any claim. Uh, I want to make sure that people realize that, that it doesn't cost you anything to make a phone call. And um, you, these, these guys know what they're talking about. They're, they're local. They understand the Philly market. So um, thank you for that offer. And anything else you want to leave us with? Um, actually, just if you could just tell us, how do people reach out to you? <laughs> yeah, sure. So one, one other thing is not only do we help with claims, but to the point of having the right coverages, we provide a service where we'll go through your policy, make sure that you do have the right coverages. And if you don't, we'll tell you what to get. Um, not that an agent or a broker wouldn't do that, but we see it from a different perspective. We want to make sure that you're overcovered. I mean, I, I wish I could show you the, the coverages I have in my house are absurd for no reason, only because I know this industry. Um, but yeah, so to reach us, uh, ClarkandCohen.com, all of our information is on there. Our whole team has profiles. You can read all about us, about our history, about the claims we've had, uh, who we handle claims for, some of our bigger clients. Um, and anytime you want to reach out, you call you call the call the, the office. You, you press six, and it comes right to me. So. I'm always available. Like I said in the beginning, I have two little girls. There's not much sleeping that goes on at our house. So anytime anyone needs us, please feel free to reach out. You can be on online, call. Anyway, we're happy to help. So I can attest to that. These guys are responsive and, and, and super nice. And I would encourage people to reach out. So thank you, Blake. Thanks for your time. And um, maybe we can talk again, dive deep into some more issues. Yeah, if anyone wants to learn about the insurance industry, please give us a call. I appreciate it, Cheryl. All right. Take care. Thank you. Thank you.